Today, I have another wonderful guest, my dear friend, Sara Sade. When life gives her challenges, she makes books. I don't know how it happened, but you know, writing is a form of, of therapy that I began just writing. I showed a friend and she said, listen, you're a really good writer. There's something there. Try and turn it into something. Adriana had hip dysplasia. Ryan Rio had breath holding syndrome, which is the child will cry and then not take a breath in. Hope for the best, learn along the way and come out the other side a changed and hopefully a better person. And enjoy the process. And enjoy the process as much as you can. That's asking a little too much, don't you think? The perfection is in the imperfections. It's not going to be smooth sailing. It's not going to be a perfect life, perfect day, perfect whatever. Today, I have another wonderful guest uh, in my mini-series of The Remarkable Women of the Middle East. Uh, someone who is, of course, a good friend, but also truly, truly remarkable. You know that saying, uh, when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. Uh, my dear friend, Sara Sade, when, when life gives her uh, uh, challenges, she makes books, which is quite interesting. So uh, Sara Sadek in English has uh, um, been blessed with a daughter that was diagnosed with a, an interesting challenge at a very young age. And as a result of that, she uh, wrote uh, a, a wonderful book uh, about motherhood uh, that basically was I think raw and clear, uh, the uh, finding the magic in mummyhood uh, that basically became a bestseller, published in New York. And then, uh, w you know, a, a, a couple of years later, when life gave us uh, lockdown, uh, she she built a, a children's book, uh, The Extraordinary uh, Pause. And it keeps going every now and then. Uh, life, uh, you know, turns uh, left, as I always say, when things go wrong, life turns left for Sarah and Sarah decides to uh, to write about it. And uh, she's originally a master's, you know, earned a master's degree in human rights. She worked in the United Nations and uh, worked here in, the, uh, in Dubai for uh, the prime minister's office for a while and eventually decided that she is on a journey to find what truly uh, matters to her in life, if you want, which I think is what is truly remarkable. Uh, Sarah's constant attempt, our, our very last coffee a couple of weeks ago, was entirely focused on the idea, so what do I do now, right? Uh, I'm very good at what I do, but can I do differently? Can I do something completely extraordinary? Can I do something that I have not done before? And I think that search, as I always said, uh, is uh, what makes a person remarkable. The, the remarkable, as I always say in, in this series, is not about where you are in life, it's about the road uh, that you took to get to where you are in life. The journey, I think, is what is remarkable. Uh, as I have this conversation uh, with uh, the remarkable women of the Middle East, I think what's also extre extremely remarkable is every one of them shows up with cookies. So I'm going to add like <laughs> 200 Although kilograms. Although not me, not homemade. <laughs> I should have put them in a Tupperware and yeah. pretended, but yeah, it's, it's not. They're, they're probably, I mean, honestly, some of the nicest chocolate cookies on the planet. So with my coffee, I think I'm going to ex extend that series for uh, infinitely, honestly, because the cookies <laughs> are the amazing. Cookies. With the Sarah, cookies. Sarah, so, so nice to meet you. Thank you for having me. Uh, again and again and again, every time it's wonderful to meet. And I, uh, I look at, um, at this mini series uh, in two ways. One, one is I try to introduce the world uh, to a side of the Middle East that CNN and Fox News and BBC conveniently forget to show to the world, uh, which is what I interact with every day. You know, incredibly intelligent, open-minded, well-educated, impactful women who are, in my personal view, ex are examples for the women of the world. And to actually really, really embrace their emotions and femininity, we're very good at that here in the Middle East, and at the same time be successful and impactful. But I think the other side is that uh, is that idea of showing the journey, the road, right? right? And your the big, even the beginning, the very beginning of your road, 
uh, was quite challenging. So can we start there? It was, yes. So I wrote, I think I wrote my first book because, not I think for sure, because Adriana was diagnosed, my firstborn, who's now nine, was diagnosed with hip dysplasia. So what that is, alhamdulillah, it's a completely fixable problem. So by no means something, you know, that somebody might be taken aback from, but it was my first baby. And what hip dysplasia is, is that the hip, the ball of the hip is growing out, is misaligned from the socket, basically. So she had to be in a brace for seven months. Um, again, first baby, I'm living in Dubai. I don't have my parents here. I don't have my tribe, so to speak, not my sister, not my best friends, childhood friends. And I was very taken aback. Um, and I just, I don't know how it happened, but you know, writing is a form of, of therapy, you know, mm. as we all well know that I began just writing all the things I couldn't share with my husband, all the things I felt guilty for even feeling or thinking like, okay, I don't want to hold her. I don't want to change her diaper. I feel so guilty. What did I do so that she has this diagnosis? What was something my fault? What This whole culmination of questions that I couldn't share with anyone but my paper and pen and crying on the balcony, <laughs> honestly, for hours and hours until I showed a friend and she said, listen, you're a really good writer. There's something there tweak it, try and turn it into something. And that's where the thread, the common thread through it all was finding the magic in mommyhood, as in there is no magic in life, in motherhood, in anything you're going through. There's no, you know, I don't believe in toxic positivity of, hey, it's amazing. Yeah, let's go through it. The silver lining. No, you create your own. Mm. And so that's essentially why I wrote the book. And yeah. What do you mean there is no magic? That's a, that's a very big statement. Yes. So I strongly believe that there is magic. Every day there's magic, but magic is in the mess. So it's this Japanese notion that I'm strongly married to, committed to, believe in it wholeheartedly, which is wabi-sabi, that the perfection is in the imperfections. It's not going to be smooth sailing. It's not going to be a perfect life, perfect day, perfect whatever, but it's in those coffee spills and, you know, hiccups and mishaps and unexpected encounters in life and obstacles that you find the magic and silver lining and grow as a person. So you mean by, by, by there is no magic, you mean there is no perfection. There is no picture Absolutely. perfect, uh, you know, the life that they show us on TV. Absolutely. But that there is a ton of joy in the mess that they don't show us on yes. TV. I am 100% with you on yeah. this. As a matter of fact, you know, the way, the way I always try to explain is I say it's sweet and sour, right? right? When, you know, sweet and sour is delicious, not because of the sweet only, yes. right? It's because of the sweet and the sour. And the sour sometimes is so a little sour. too much, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but, but then that's actually uh, not easy because, uh, so, so, so I know that statistically, uh, of course, uh, you know, there is a very high likelihood uh, compared to typical, you know, um, um, the typical life of a woman of actually becoming depressed after of course. Uh, after childbirth or actually during pregnancy and of, so on. Of course. So, so it's, not, it's not an unusual thing for no. a woman to struggle with her feelings and thoughts yes. at that time. And I really appreciate what you said at the very beginning, which is CNN and the world in its entirety shows you this version of motherhood that I'm sorry, especially when it comes to the Middle East, you almost feel guilty for feeling what you feel. You mm. almost feel guilty for saying, yes, my daughter has hip dysplasia. Yes, she's in a brace for seven to eight months. Yes, I'm scared. Yes, I'm nervous. Yes, I'm this. Yes, I'm that. I don't feel a connection with her at that time. Alhamdulillah, it's, we're way past that now. But you almost are you feel judged for feeling that. And I think the line needs to be almost blurred. It needs to be, we need to speak about it being okay to not be okay. Not this toxic positivity. No, I had a shit day and I sat in it and I cried and my husband told me, don't be ridiculous. And this and this and this happened. And I came out of it from the other side, whether it's hip dysplasia, 
or my son's breath holding syndrome, which is a whole other story, uh, you come out of it, the other side changed. Mm. And I would not be the mom or person that I am today if I hadn't experienced all that I experienced. For I, I, sure. I, ha- I have to say, this is really inspiring for me, honestly. You know, so you, in a way, you are the voice of every angry mother. Uh, that has I hope so. <laughs> yeah, that has that has kept it inside, right? Right. B- but most angry mothers keep it inside uh, because we don't feel it is. We don't feel there's a platform to speak about it. We don't feel it's okay to say, "I'm worried," and this and this happened, and oh, I feel like this, and oh, I feel like that. It's not so well accepted. So let, let's talk about it now. Let's be okay. that voice Let's now. Cry. Yeah. <laughs> Let's cry. Let's cry about it now. No, but, no, but, but I actually, I actually believe this will be a very interesting outlet to my listeners. You know, so give me a sample, as as many examples as you can of feelings that you wanted to share. Uh, okay. Well, with Adriana, hip dysplasia, she's in a pavlic harness, which is essentially she's in a frog-like position for seven to eight months, for twenty-three hours of the day. Twenty-three hours. And this is your firstborn, you know, it's a girl, you want her to be wearing cute shorts and pants and shoes. And she had to be in, you know, long dresses, which I felt was part of my way of dealing with it because I was covering the brace and explaining to people nonstop. What happened to her? Did you drop her? Did you drop oil on her? Did you, I mean, the questions were just unfiltered. And nonstop. And that is why maybe in month two, my now, still my pediatrician, who's an amazing Palestinian mom of four, told me, listen, you will break your relationship with her unless you sit alone and you accept the fact of what's happening to you and just, you know, deal with it, so to speak. And that's, again, part of my, I have a chapter in my book about coping mechanisms and what is your currency as a mom, as a human being in life? What is your currency? We'll, we'll, we'll go back to that. Okay. I, I, I want the, uh, the uh, bitching session first. Nonstop okay. bitching session. So, so, so you feel attacked by people, you feel judged, judged. you feel yeah. embarrassed, you feel guilty. Yes. yes. You, you feel helpless. Definitely. You feel uncertain about right. the future. Yes. And that's not isolated to hip dysplasia. I was just going to say, say, surprise, surprise. No, that is my that's like morning any, yeah. every, yeah. <laughs> it's like every I'm, mother, right? Exactly. Yeah. And I don't think it's specific to mothers. I think it's human nature that we are confronted with these obstacles. No, I remember vividly when my wonderful ex, Nibel, when she, when she, when we left Egypt to go to Dubai and the it was, you know, two years into one and a half years after Ali was born, I think, or two years after Ali was born, uh, it was mainly because of those feelings that, you know, Ali was wonderful. Aya was a young child at the time. They were okay, right? But the thing is that everyone attacked her and attacked me and attacked everyone. It's like, or, you know, wh- why are you doing this? Why is she crying? Why is he saying this? Why is that happening? But why it's, is it, right? it's, of course, it's the nonstop judgment where they feel they have the right mm-hmm to express their opinion. Yeah. And I learned that I don't wanna hear it unless I ask. Mm. If I say, what do you think I should do? Then I'm able and willing to receive what you have to say. Like when I said, career-wise, what do I do now? What's my next step? I'm thinking about this, this, and this. Unless I ask you, don't dish Absolutely. it out. Absolutely. Don't give it to me because yeah. I'm not gonna be standing there with open arms, ready to receive it, especially when it comes to my kids. Mm. It's just not gonna happen. Mm. The, the opposite is also true. So you mentioned your, that your husband, when you shared with him, he would dismiss some of what you feel yes, because well, he doesn't get it, right? No, He's not, not a mother. On, exactly, not only that, but it comes back to your currency, mm. your coping mechanism. My husband is, I mean, love of my life. I've known him since I was seven. Uh, we, Seriously? Yeah, we grew up together in Saudi no Arabia. No way. Yeah. That's, uh, that, that's isn't a bit that crazy? creepy, isn't is it? it? <laughs> is it creepy? Not an arranged marriage, but uh-huh. yeah, one of those stories where... You he, knew him since you were yeah, seven. I swear. How old was he then? Seven. In the same uh, second grade class. Actually, so I have to tell you, so when my daughter was oh, that, entering... I know, I want to know that. That's so, so cool. Wait, when my daughter was entering second grade, she spent. she's now in fourth. 
She spent an hour fixing her hair, her uniform, you know, like uh, awkward with herself, like just fixing, fixing. And I went into her room. I said, what is going on? You're going to be late. School, blah, blah, blah. And she said, yeah, well, you know, I might meet my husband. We don't oh. know. And I said, yeah, but maybe not. But maybe, <laughs> yeah, let's just, you know, focus on studies. Okay, that, that that gives her like a a, a, um, a pressure that is I not know, needed right? at this age. It's yes, like, you know, it's, it's him. No, it's no, he, Yeah, he's too short. It's no, true. that one. It's yeah, true. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. But so his coping mechanism until today or currency. No, I don't want to go there. Is uh, how, how did it turn from, uh, you know, stealing his toys uh, in school? Oh, you want the love story. I want the love okay, story. So he wrote me, he will deny this. He wrote me a Valentine card. <laughs> he would deny saying, this. Saying, yeah, <laughs> saying you are nice or something like that. You are that, nice. Yeah, you are nice. <laughs> Be my Valentine. Yeah. Uh -huh. And actually. How old were you? Seven. But Man, this is before that boy. before email. So mm -hmm. we used to write letters in high school. He was living in the States. I went to an all-girls Catholic boarding school in London, and we used to write letters as friends. Mm. It's crazy. Mm. So buddies in, in, in kindergarten or like primary school, then f pen pals. And yeah. then uh, best there was friends something in called New pen York. pals. Yeah. yeah. Then best friends in New York. You both studied in New York. Uh, no, we both worked in New York. He okay. studied in New York. I studied in London, uh -huh. but we, he was my, I swear it's such a, like a universe was giving me a sign because he was my guarantor for my apartment. So my mail, my bills used to arrive with his name and my name and we weren't dating. We weren't, it's crazy. I know such a premonition, right? That's so cool. It's so weird. Right. Yes. And then when did he uh, or you suddenly realize, I like him another no, way? No, so he is very strategic <laughs> and pragmatic. <laughs> he was interviewing in Dubai and asked me out for dinner. And I said, you know, we have dinner once a week. What do you mean? He said, no, get dressed. Serious dinner, me and you. And it was right away. That first dinner where we went in with a... Yeah, different best, best marriages, I would say. Yeah, it's good. And then he moved to Dubai. Then well, I moved to Dubai, and the whole thing. Okay, so so uh, uh, I like that love tangent. That was no, like I, a, this is this is to me this story. is hope, right? I mean, so now you know uh, uh, you like him since he was seven. You still like him today. I do, but okay. it's funny. So the thing about marrying a childhood friend is you can't pretend, even if you want to. <laughs> he knows me. <laughs> so well uh -huh. uh, for good and bad uh, that you can't I think, I think that's the key to relaxing. Every, that's the key to every marriage. Huh? It's I like so. basically accepting yeah. uh, even the annoying bullying bits of you right. when you were a teenager. But it's I like, don't have annoying bits. Uh, Maybe he does. Uh, no, uh, I'm, kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. But yeah, that's definitely it. I yeah. think that's part of the secret. So, so you were saying his coping mechanism. Right. Yeah. So his currency or coping mechanism when it comes to Adriana's hip dysplasia or Ryan's breath holding syndrome, which was another... What's that? So I had basically three kids in three years. Adriana had hip dysplasia. Ryan Rio had breath holding syndrome, which is involuntarily the child will cry and then not take a breath in. So he turns blue. He used to turn oh blue mm. and get very, almost have a seizure, uh, very stiff and then faint. So the first time it happened, um, Omar's brother had just passed away, his younger brother. So we were already in this heightened sense of, you know, emotion. I, I don't know what it was, heightened sense of just, you know, appreciating life and just life is short and trying to appreciate every moment. He had this syndrome that was triggered by pain. So I still remember it was after a birthday party, he had come home, he had had a bit of sugar, was running around, tripped, fell. And then I knew from Omar's scream that something was wrong. And he's holding this almost life less body. So I rush over, rip open his polo or attempt to rip it open, start CPR, and then he wakes up. So I immediately call my pediatrician at, who knows me very well because Adriana's had hip dysplasia, come out of the brace, you know, close that chapter. 
learned and grown. And now I'm dealing with another hiccup, you know? So she says, you know, it's involuntary and you just have to deal with it. But it, it was two years of us waiting. Is he going to trip? Is this going to happen? Don't make him cry so much that he doesn't stop breathing. And it was, I mean, I kind of laugh about it now, not really, but it was, yeah, it was, So, so how, how does a mother, having gone through this, you know, Adriana, and then this, you know, how, how do you stay optimistic? How do you stay so positive about life? That's a good question. So I think I changed so much as a person. And I think you ultimately, it's not you, it's not you become a mom. I mean, yes, you become a mom, but you have to not lose part of who you are. How do I stay positive is my crutch is very much Japanese philosophy. <clears throat> Whether it's wabi-sabi, the perfection in, in the imperfections, or kintsugi, which is, I think that's how you pronounce it, kintsugi, which is they... Kintsugi. Kintsugi, <laughs> which is basically uh, in Japan, they used to fill cracks in, they would find vases or artifacts that had cracks and fill them with gold. Yeah, I love that. I love that, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. it's the whole philosophy that you would not be where you are without the hardships and you cannot fulfill your full potential unless you pass through these obstacles. Yeah. And that's very much how I parent. It's very much how I live my life. So I think like leaning on these as a crutch, these kind of theories and philosophies has helped. So, so the, the, we started by saying there was beauty in those cracks and in those right. scars. And, right. you know, I, I have to admit, you know, if, if you really follow slow-mo uh, over time, a big chunk of slow-mo is actually about our scars, right? right. So, so one of the most connected conversations you can ever have with someone is a conversation around what had happened and what they learned uh, you know, the fact that they're sitting in front of me means that they mm. made it, made right. it through, right? And exactly, uh, and how they changed. Yeah, and, and in, in a way, I think the scar then is sort of the trophy for for uh, for having gone through it. But I think the challenge is while you're going through it, you don't see it this way. Definitely, you yeah. don't. Yeah. And you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. And one of my favorite quotes is Rumi's, quote that there is that cracks are what let the light through. Yeah. And if I hadn't experienced what I experienced, I wouldn't be the mom I am. I wouldn't be the person that I am. I wouldn't believe so strongly in this philosophy that no, you, we need to not only expose, but we need to embrace these cracks mm -hmm. and faults and flaws. And, you know, there's perfection in these imperfections. So coping mechanisms. So uh, f first of all, you know, clearly if you have uh, allowed yourself to write about it to the whole world, then yeah. basically you're encouraging that people talk about those challenges when they go through right. them. But then you, you, you keep going back to that idea of currencies. What, what is that? So I'm the daughter of a Palestinian man and a Lebanese woman. And my father walked to Southern Lebanon in 1948. So being raised by, I mean, by them both, but by him and hearing hearing him say, nothing is a big deal. And w w walked to, just for, for walked people to, who are not oh, aware sorry. of the history. So that means he became a Palestinian refugee. Refugee, that's right. In Lebanon. In Lebanon. In so 1948. He, so after, uh, you know, after the declaration. Exactly. All right, of Israel. So, as a, yeah. so he walked from North Palestine to South Lebanon. That's uh, like, what? 15 days or 10 days, something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. So this really changed. I mean, people talk about neuroplasticity. I think a lot of the times it's not, you're not volunteering to change, but things happen to you that force your mindset to shift, force mm. you to think a different way. And his philosophy on life is very much, everything should be fun uh, to a certain degree and nothing is a big deal. So when we tested positive, for example, when we tested positive with COVID 
and we're all under lockdown and nobody really knew what it was and what it meant. And we were one of the first families to test positive in our network. I called him like, daddy, oh my God, you know, we, we we're all positive. He said, isn't that great? You have COVID <laughs> the same time as President Trump. <laughs> I mean, did he say that? Yeah, he did. Uh -huh. And I, you know, was taken aback a bit, maybe upset. And I, I said, daddy, no, you're not understanding that we all test positive. He said, yeah, but then you're done. Then you're, you know, then you have the antibodies. Mm -hmm. So there's always this positive twist, positive to twist a negative issue. that yes, you're in it now. Hip dysplasia, yes, you're in it now. But what does this mean later? How but have you grown? I, I, th I think it's uh, it's quite an interesting, uh, I call that committed acceptance, right? So so your dad has committed acceptance and fun. It's quite an interesting way of looking at it because, you know, if you're all diagnosed with COVID and he's sitting on the other side of the phone, obviously there is nothing he can do to cure you right, right now, right? Obviously he understands that you're an intelligent enough and wise enough mother and woman and, uh, and, and wife that you're going to take care of the family and do the absolute best yes. that you can to cure everyone, despite the fact that, you know, you're, you're sick now. You, if he tells you an advice, yeah. oh, oh, you know, go to a doctor, like that's a stupid advice. You're, right. you're already gone to a doctor, exactly. right? Exactly. Uh, but but then but then he basically says if there is nothing I can do to make it go away I might as well just make you cheer up a little bit right, right? and you don't want to add fuel to fire yeah so you don't want to make it a bigger deal that I mean halas it's done this is the reality that I'm living and so a lot of I don't want to say a lot of my style of parenting is fact this is what it is this is the situation what can we do what can we do about it nothing or something or do you just have to ride the wave and live through whatever situation you're in now, hope for the best, learn along the way and come out the other side, a changed and hopefully a better person. And enjoy the process. And enjoy the process as much as you can. Yeah. That's asking a little too much, don't you think? It is. And I'm not saying I do it all the time. I'm not saying anyone should, but having that as a goal post in your mind, I mean, why not? Mm. Why not? So let's take a few examples, you know, young mother having to go back to work, economy is difficult. You're saying, look, it is what it is, you know. But what is it going to change if you complain or if you sit? I'm, I'm not saying toxic positivity, everything is great, clap your hands, snap your finger. But I'm saying there's something to be said in addressing yourself and saying, okay, fact, this is the reality of the situation. What can I do? How can I change it? How can I grow from the situation that I'm in? Yeah, hallelujah, I agree. Yeah, uh, honestly, a, I mean, so 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 I, you know, I'm writing now about love and romance. So F finding love is probably the one book that I will write that nobody will read. Okay, I will. <laughs> Thank you. I promise, I will. <laughs> because because I'm upsetting everyone. Right, I'm really, okay. I really am. I'm sort of debugging the uh, the myth that Hollywood and Bollywood and Disney and everyone has told us about love, and you know, mainly also about relationships. Like, honestly, relationships are not fun. Most of the time, there are arguments. There are, you know, there is work to be done. There are responsibilities to be shared. There are, you know, sometimes uh, misalignments and so on and so forth. Yeah. And if you don't walk into them expecting that, good luck, right? And and you know, it, 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 I think what you're saying is that yeah. And by the way, you're you 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 know you you could dream of a child all your life, and then you get that crumbly little thing in your hand, and you know it's not pretty, but you're gonna tell yourself it's the cutest thing ever. Uh, and yeah, uh, but that's the danger of it. Behind anything, behind love, parenting, this correct preconceived notion that we have to feel like this. Yeah, there was that Seinfeld episode of like uh, you have to hold the baby. Like I don't want to yeah, hold yeah, the baby. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah, yeah. That's I, the thing. And why is it bad to be honest? Why is it bad to be truthful in because people your will think of it, on love? People will think of, you know, if you say, oh, you know, my my son is, I, Ali was ugly, like like a bulldog, really. <laughs> I I, I, we all are when you're born like I a know. child. Mo mothers look at them and they say, this is the cutest thing ever. I think their spirit is the cutest yeah. thing ever. Yeah. 
But honestly, when you're four days old, you're like a bulldog, like literally a bulldog, right? And I don't know people who love bulldogs. I don't get it either. <laughs> but, you know, but but the but the idea is that it's okay to say that. It's okay to say, oh my God, so crumbly. And why is he so grumpy? And then two yeah. weeks later, he's prettier, yeah. right? That's wonderful. Can I tell you, this is why kids for me are amazing. Mm -hmm. Because zero filter zero agenda. I'm telling you, I go to the beach with my kids and right away, mommy, why don't you, why aren't you going to the gym? Why is your leg like, why is it like this? Why is it like that? Completely unfiltered, completely unrehearsed, just so authentic. Mm. And there's something to be said about that. Yeah, but I think society that accepts that from a kid and we celebrate it right. and we laugh and from about adults, it from no. adults. Yeah. Like, you know, what's wrong with you? Yeah, of course, of <laughs> yeah, course, right? Because it's unexpected, uh -huh. and you don't expect adults to voice that out. So I'm, I'm actually thinking that this conversation is so far mostly about voice it out nicely, yeah, right? Gently. Or, or, or gently, or not if you have to, but right. but voice it out, right? Yeah, yeah. Go Be back to honest, currencies. Voice it right. Mm -hmm. So current, go back to currency. So my currency, I, I feel like you've known me a few times now. I. Really, honestly, my currency is humor. That is my way of dealing with, oops, I broke my phone. It's completely shattered. It doesn't yeah, work. did you do that Yeah, to your I phone? don't know. I don't, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> it's totally broken. But yes, humor. Adriana in a brace, she, I mean, looked, it was traumatic. It was, you know, people were asking me questions and I would say, no, she's training for the Olympics. <laughs> Not for them, but for me to accept you know, what I was going through. I love humor. Yeah. I, I honestly think it's the most underrated tool in history. Me too. But ultimately you have to think- Respectful more. humor, right? Like, you right. know, yeah, it's, it's it's basically making it clear that we're yes. just, you know, it's it's such yeah. a, um, it's such a, a, a difficult, unavoidable situation. And we're just going to laugh gonna about do? it exactly. for now. What are you going to do exactly? I mean, you'll cry later, but you can also laugh about it a little mm -hmm. bit. Yeah. They say, they say that laughter is actually a brain response for the unexpected. Like if something yeah. is so unlike what you expect it to be, you laugh sense. about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, and what other currencies are there? So either being extremely maternal, either being very pragmatic. I mean, in my first book, I call Omar, my husband, I call him Mr. Excel because everything is figures. So hip dysplasia is... What that means is the angle of her hips is... Is my was, man. <laughs> it was maybe 41, 42, and it should be 21. So she was in a pelvic harness, in a brace, to bring the dimension, the degree of the opening of her hips smaller, yeah. less. Yeah. He dove so deep into this. I, can, I can't even explain to you. Just because that was his way of managing the situation. Mm -hmm. At, scientifically, what are the figures? What are the ratios? What are the statistics? And then he felt better and felt like he, okay, was okay. Mm. You know, my, less, emo very pragmatic. My, my kind of person. Your kind of guy. Yeah, yeah, Your yeah. kind like, of guy. You know, over coffee, we would have a very long conversation oh that starts with 42. Right. That's and then true. and then half an hour of silence and then say 41.6. Right? And then saying <laughs> good in between. Yeah, exactly. And then wait, yeah, yeah. Very different. Very different. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. Uh -huh. So so let's talk about uh, the extraordinary pause. So so you you go from writing a mummy book to, a memoir, yeah, yeah to, my story. Yeah, to a uh, children's book, which right. is also in a way your story. It is. Mm. So when we were under lockdown, you know, all of Dubai was under lockdown. I realized that my kids who, I think my youngest was three at the time, couldn't understand why is daddy home? Why are we all having lunch together <laughs> every day? Yeah. Complaining why, about it? Why yeah. is daddy home? No, in a good way. But why is daddy <laughs> opening the door saying, well, guys, what's for lunch? Why is he? It was just, you know, the whole turmoil of the situation. And so I wrote it for my kids. I wrote it to explain to them that, look, what we're going through is not about, well, let's wash our hands. There's a virus. It's more about you know, again, going back to the same theme of what is the magic in the mess? What we're all under lockdown, but what are we gaining from this? The extraordinary pause is for, it forced us to slow down. We were all together. And if you ask my kids today, thankfully, they say that it was the best five weeks, six weeks, the best time. 
ever. It definitely was. Yeah. Yeah. They, I mean, they look at it with such fond memories and no rules and yeah. ordering and the tent in the living room, the whole mess. But yeah, that's... I mean, to, to, to me, Yasara, honestly, so so my all of my retreats, I've been retreating very extensively in the last year and a half. Last year, I did 40 days in a row and then I did two weeks in a row and so on. It's beautiful. It's I call it voluntary lockdown, right? That's so I, crazy. Yeah, I, I, Where you yeah. don't speak or you I, don't... I allow myself 45 minutes a day on my phone. Okay. And avoid speaking altogether. But, you know, in my 40 days lockdown, my lockdown, <laughs> in my 40 days retreat, I yeah. had a wonderful landlord, uh, an older lady who would show up. Um, Where maybe did you every, do it? In, in Dubai? No, I was in uh, the countryside in the UK. Okay. It actually didn't matter okay. where. I yeah. found an, a converted barn somewhere. Yeah. Uh, and I drove like on the on the wrong side of the road. It was scary for me, first oh time God. in my life. Yeah, and uh, and you know, drove for like seven eight hours to get to that very remote place. Uh, couldn't find it because you know she sort of like hinted to the area. Yeah. And then I got there, and there was <laughs> no phone fun. connection. Right. So oh my God. so I had to like ask around the old way. I had to go to the neighbors, See, but knock that's the, the door. Best Beautiful. Way because you're connecting, Beautiful, and yeah. now yeah. in this digitized, disgusting world where I go to a cafe and I say, can I order? And they say, scan the QR code. I, and I, I say, refuse. I want to, that's what I, I said. I refuse. I said, I, I, I want to know where yeah. you're from, how your day has been. Yeah. What, I'm sorry, there needs to be some no, form no, no, of No, 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 my number one target, my, like I don't go to cafes that will force me to do awful. electronic stuff. It's I basically, awful. I look at them like a like a little kitten and I say, do you have paper for yeah. old people? Like, it's I awful. Yeah. yeah. Honestly, and people, my husband included, make fun of me because I have a physical agenda. I and love I, those. Yeah, and I brainstorm on moleskin notebooks and on... Paper, random papers and napkins. I like it. And do you, do, you, do you write your books with a pen as well? Uh, no, I write the outline and the beginnings of it always on paper. Always. Oh, man, I yeah. should do that. You should. You know, I, I go the opposite way. I dictate it to an AI tool. No, that... <laughs> stop it. No, but, but hold on, hold stop on. The, there, is, there is actual... Uh, there is actual um, uh, wisdom in that because so when I went on lockdown, or so not lockdown again. I love retreat, that you keep calling it lockdown <laughs> because, because that's I what I do. Under, oh my god, that's what I do. I literally go out to that place, right? And I and I, you know, as I as I was saying, I had this wonderful old lady that was my landlord who would show up every third day because she needs to talk to someone and she speaks to me for ten minutes. Yeah. I listen to for ten minutes, then hug her, and then disappear again for the rest of the day, right? And it was incredible. And 40 days, I can tell you. Huh? They say I don't that, know if I could do that. Oh, everyone can. Right. So so the, fir the first three days, you're unable to kick the habit. Right. And then uh, you start to suddenly recognize how much time you're, you're wasting on devices and conversations and so on. Yeah. And then a week to eight days in, something magical happens. Like That's you suddenly crazy. slow down. And you, you so, so I, the way I, I wrote six chapters in 30 days. Yeah, I days. remember you said, yeah? of course. Because I, si I would sit for five hours, do yeah, nothing, yeah. get a massive download, you know, write paper notes of it. And then I would dictate it to uh, to otter.ai, my, my uh, transcription uh, tool. And by the end of the evening, I've written a 20 pages cha chapter. It's unbelievable. Yeah, unbelievable. And, and it's all because of that distance if you want yeah. the the extraordinary pause i think the pause really yes. is can you allow your brain to have a space to actually tell you something useful that's the thing yeah that every time i ask my brother or sister i'm the youngest of three so every time i tell them i'm not sure i'm thinking about pivoting and giving children's workshops about writing and storytelling and this whole thing I'm not sure. And they say, yeah, but you know what? Take an afternoon off, go to the beach. And I say, my reaction, yeah. my knee jerk How reaction. How is that going to help? Exactly. Yeah. My knee, knee jerk, re jerk reaction is saying, no, I can't. I have to prep for this. I have to do this and the kids yeah, and this and this. I know your energy. And the to-do list. <laughs> and they say, yeah, just, you know, it'll come. Yeah. It'll come in the silence, but I get it now. 
Yeah, my, 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 we, we spoke about this last mm-hmm. time when we had coffee. My, my biggest advice yeah. is what I call a mini silent retreat. Yeah. And a mini silent retreat is you set your alarm on one of, one of the two days of the week. And I do that every other week. I set my alarm to 3 p.m. Okay. And I wake up in the morning, no time pieces, no uh, books to read, no internet, yes. no music is allowed, but no lyrics, right? No uh, lyrics. Yeah. No interaction with people. Uh, and basically I have a paper and, uh, and a pen and I don't interact with the world until three o'clock. Right. So the alarm is not to get me to do anything is to stop me from doing anything until the alarm goes off. Right. And, and what happens is, I don't know, I may end up waking up at 6am or seven or nine. I don't know because I don't have a time piece. Yeah. That and- sounds like an interesting form of punishment. For me, I don't. I mean, I'm interested, but also I feel that I just have this need to connect. What's What's the longest meditation you've done? Um, meditation is when you don't talk, right? I'm kidding. (laughs) I'm kidding. Uh, Maybe no, maybe twenty minutes. Yeah, twenty minutes. Yeah. So I, I I think a very interesting path to silence is aim for a forty minutes meditation. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's That's it's actually so interesting that where your mind goes. Because the resistance follows a very interesting chart. You can imagine my 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 engineer's mind is always yeah. drawing charts. Yeah. So you get much higher resistance hmm, uh, to the meditation in the first four or five minutes. Yeah, and then less. And then by the by by minute 30 or 40, when when your timer goes off. Yeah. You're like, why? Why did it go off, right? It's become so, wow. you become so into it. Do you meditate every day? I did it religiously for a thousand days in a row. Okay. Wow. Yeah, so I- That's ne- very specific. I, yeah, 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 I do, I do very specific. My, my, my self-reform is very, very, very yeah. engineered, right? For a thousand days in a row, and I used a meditation device, I did not miss a single day, wow. right? Uh, now I am a lot more um, joyful about it. So, so I I choose to meditate for the joy of it. Right. Okay. I don't advise that. To, uh, by the way, to our listeners, I advise that you have a rigorous practice yeah. until you absolutely feel that you you can meditate on demand. Okay. Uh, but it, to me, uh, you know, especially when I deal with people who struggle with very active minds, if yeah. you think a lot. Okay. Is this an intervention now? I'm kidding. Uh, absolutely. I'm kidding. Is this, are you talking to I mean, me or I'm, the listeners? I mean, or, I mean in, in a way, in uh, the wink, way. wink. I know you're People like, and this is active. why <laughs> the guy comes in with the gong and we're going to be meditating. I, I, I definitely think it is one of the very, uh, one of the very few mind practices uh, that I wrote in the in that little voice in your head that I always say is, indispensable. Like you can't live without yeah. doing two or three years of daily meditations. Yeah. You will recognize an incredible upgrade in your brain uh, because the whole idea of, you know, when you say humor, for example, is your coping mechanism, yeah. that's neuroplasticity. Of course. Right? This is basically you over the years of growing up with a, with a father that, you know, made humor his way through yeah. challenging times you sort of keep doing that. You use those neural networks over and over. It becomes very easy for you. It's incredible that you say that. That's That could not be more true because it's involuntary. And when I first got married, part of the fights with my husband was, you Can can't you be serious? joke, yeah. why yeah. are you joking yeah. about a budget? Yeah. We are discussing budget and what we think and you know our kids' savings and this and that. And that. Please be serious. And I just, it's very difficult for me to be serious. It is. Yeah. I mean, believe it or not. So Nibel and I were the opposite. I was joking all the time. Really? Yeah. But that's why. It's a very Egyptian thing, right? But that's why We laugh about anything. But that's why you could never be with somebody like you. I was. A joker. No, no. I mean, now now I'm a lot more balanced. I can be, I, I, I love laughing, honestly. I think, I think the reality is. Uh, you could do what you have to do, like the serious stuff in 10, 15, 20 minutes. Right. Exactly. Uh, yeah, let's get exactly. it done. And then the rest of the day should be. Exactly. This is how times. I, yeah. Right. Yeah, That's yeah. exactly how I, how I think, but not everybody thinks that way. You also, 
something else that is not like everybody around you is you seem to be quite rebellious and free. You go wherever your mind tells you. So you go from books to teaching kids how to write books. Yes, that's right. So that's kind of the pivot I'm in the midst of making. So there should be, it's basically, I've developed this acronym and kind of a new method where I teach kids to write stories. And the whole premise of it is everybody's a storyteller. So when I was in schools reading The Extraordinary Pause, launching it in different schools, a lot of um, a lot of the questions I would get from kids was, how did you write? How were you inspired? How do you do it? More about the book than the story of The Extraordinary Pause. Mm, mm. So I've... The process, more about the process of writing. More about the process, yeah. exactly. So I realized that writing you know, as a tool for kids is something that should definitely be explored in kids. Yeah. Almost more, similarly, as important as reading, if not more, in my opinion. I, I, I have to admit, so when I was at uh, at Microsoft, we had a coach that came and taught us once as the leadership team. And I don't remember his name, but he taught us about storytelling as part of doing business. Yeah. Exactly. And, uh, and and it's really, really changed my life. Yes. You know, but, the idea of storytelling for everything, right? Huh? For for attracting a partner, for doing business, for, uh, you know, selling your story, for mm -hmm. convincing someone of something. It's so true. And ultimately there's this book that was written maybe, I don't know, long, long time ago. I completely forgot the name of the author, sorry, but it's called Made to Stick. And it's all about- I remember Made to Stick, yeah. yeah. It's all about marketing. So if I tell you a story, paint a visual and it's just this, you know, it's a story. I'm not, I'm not teaching you about, I, I don't have an agenda. I'm telling you, this is my story. You will maybe remember it more than me coming and saying, these are the statistics about kids writing and reading and this and that. And you know, it's, yeah. it sticks. I, I, I love that actually. I, I love that you're doing this effort as well to teach uh, to teach children how to write a story and tell a story. Yes. I think, I think every child should be vocally free enough to tell a story. Definitely. And I think we tell them not to be, believe it or not. Right. Yeah, and yeah. I think I'm empowering, I'm trying, attempting to empower kids writing skills through this art of storytelling. And whether or not they're talking about their emotional well-being or mindfulness or bullying or whatever they're going through, it's therapeutic for them as well. And so they might be talking about a ketchup bottle who's jealous of the mustard or whatever the story is, but it's really, <laughs> they're talking, this is a, a real example that a, a child has given me, but it's, you know, they're really talking about themselves and maybe they're jealous of their brother who, you know, they're depicting as a jar would, of mustard. Would, would, it be, would it be unfair if I stole that idea and wrote about it? Yes, it would be. It's copyrighted. <laughs> can I Can I pay him? A, uh, uh, because a fine, yeah, I'll put you in touch with the kid. <laughs> no, but it's such a good idea, honestly. So Isn't in, it such a great, I mean, yeah. it's crazy, these workshops. And again, I'm at the, the brink of hopefully a larger launch of them, inshallah, internationally, but it's just unfiltered, unrehearsed. They are so giving with their stories. There's, you know, there's no agenda. I want to be famous. I want to be published. I want this or that. They're just sharing their feelings I, on I, paper. I, I, can I be honest, yes, Sarah? Yeah. It's, Am I going to so, be happy or so, sad? So, so, sounds like you as well. It's like what you do. There is no agenda. I'm going to be famous. I'm going to be <laughs> in an interesting it's way. True. You just do what you feel like because doing. Because I believe that passion should be the driving Force. Again, another Japanese philosophy, which is ikigai, ikijai, which is your reason for being. And I believe part of the reason that I'm here in the universe, on earth, whatever you believe in, is either to drive the storytelling agenda, you know, quote unquote, but ultimately to maybe add that dash of humor to things that are not so humorous. But, 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 but then, but then, you know, people who are struggling to make ends meet or to, you know, to, to, uh, to live a certain life. Like there are demands right. in life. How can you flow that way? I mean, you, you seem to be completely like, yeah, whatever, you know, if, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, 
I mean, not, not everyone has that luxury, I would say. No, definitely it's a luxury. Yeah. And I don't dismiss that by any means. I'm extremely blessed to be able to do not a, yeah, whatever, if it works, it works, but kind of a, if it pulls me, I want to explore it. And somebody very smart once told me, <clears throat> pointing fingers at you, that if it doesn't pull you, you shouldn't explore it. And Absolutely. it's not meant to be yours. Absolutely. And I believe that so heavily. So yes, am I blessed to be able to explore whatever it is I'm exploring? Yes. Do I dismiss that? No. I mean, I, th I think the difference between pull and push when we when we had that conversation to me is so eye-opening because most of what I learned in business school and, you know, perseverance and so on is that we push our way through life, which I have to say is the, is the hyper-masculine way of doing right. things. It's like, you know, you find the mountain and then you carve through the stone right. to try and find your way right. through it. While, of course, there is the alternative feminine way of going through life where life itself pulls you. It, te it tells you, hey, there is a mountain here, which means you can either go right or left. Yeah. And by the way, if you have a little bit of a pain in your left side, go right. You know, it's like if you listen to those signs and go with life, sometimes yeah. things happen a lot easier. Or you have a picnic at the foot of the mountain and wait for a friend to come and meet you. And I mean, the options are love, limitless. Love, love, love this. So, so, so would you say that even those who will have to do something every day in their day job and so on, would you also say they should find some mountain picnic time? I think so. Yeah. I think so. And ultimately, I mean, there's there's a great book. Again, I forgot the author. This is awful. But it's called The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck, which he talks about that it's a game of cards. Everybody is dealt a different hand. It's not about the cards. It's not about you were born there, I was born here, your um, ex-Google guy, uh, you know what I mean? Whatever background you might have, it's not about that. It's what you do with the cards that you're dealt. I'm dealt a very different set of cards than everyone else. I am. My background, my opportunities, my failures, my obstacles, it's just different, yeah. you know? And it's what you do with that hand of cards. I, I, I think in my life in general, I rarely ever feel jealous, but that book title, I, I felt so jealous. Right? Isn't like, it so like, good? Who, who writes Solve for Happy? Like who, what, what a boring name, it's like so... you freaking mathematician, right? That's, the, that's the right way of writing. Um, and so, the cover is great. And, yeah. The cover was like a splotch of yeah, yeah. something. I normally want to close by, uh, with happiness, you know, of, of all the experiences that you've had, which by the way, I think good reminder for people is how you say that you're so blessed when you constantly say about, my father was a refugee, my first daughter was, was born with this, my, my son was born with that, you know. The, it, it seems quite interesting how you continue to say I'm blessed when such challenges come and pop up in your life. Uh, so what's your secret to that bubbly, constantly happy person that I see? coffee. <laughs> and by the way, this is the best Amen. one. This is the best one yet. But I think it's just that constant reminder that, you know, cracks are what let the light through. And honestly, it's everybody has a story. Everybody has a journey. Everybody has obstacles. And, you know, it is, it is what it is, but it's what you do with those imperfections. Are you going to fill them with gold are you going to try and tape them up and cover them? Are you going to learn from them? Are you, it's, it's what you do with those encounters in life. Yeah. Like, yeah. like our encounter, Sarah and I met, uh, through a common friend. Uh, basically she was finishing the meeting with him. I was starting the meeting with him and then she had two minutes before she had to run. I had half an hour with him. So he said, hi, hi. Uh, you know, he said, she wrote that book. I said, you're going to be on my podcast. That's right. And that's how it started, yeah, right? And, and we went on with that encounter to become very, very good friends, uh, to give you this conversation today, which I have to say, lovely and light as it is, probably deserves that you go back and listen to it one more time. You know, sometimes on slow-mo, I tell you, um, there are conversations that I try to keep briefer than normal, uh, because there are subtle gold nuggets in them. And I think 
the cracks of Sarah's life and how she turns them, constantly turns them into beautiful, beautiful experiences is something that most of us forget to do as we carve our way through the mountain. And I, and I really think that uh, a picnic at the foot of the mountain might actually be a very, very interesting idea. Sarah, wonderful to have so you. Much. Thank you for coming thank over. You. And thank you for complimenting my coffee. It was amazing. Thank you. And I, uh, and I will thank everyone listening to us for giving me the opportunity to bring you some of those conversations. Uh, I really feel uh, that this uh, series of women of the Middle East has been quite dear to my heart. It's been quite... Uh, light and informative and wonderful in so many ways. I want to remind everyone that's one of the main reasons I bring, the, bring you this series is to remind everyone that we're all the same. So whether you're listening to me in Argentina, whether you're listening to me in, uh, in, the, you know, in Japan, uh, man, woman, straight, gay, whoever you are, there are so many similarities between us and I really think that by showing you the side of this beautiful region, I hope that you will uh, remember those similarities. Uh, with that, uh, take a little bit of time this week, if you don't mind, to sit at the fo foot of the mountain and have a picnic, uh, because it doesn't really matter how uh, rushed and busy you are this week, there will always be a tiny bit of time to slow down. And I love you all for listening. As always, I ask you to spread this message, tell as many people as you can, and I will see you next time.